Hello, everyone. I'm sure you are having a great time on day one. And welcome again for another electrifying session here. I'm Mohit, your host, joining from uh, Redmond. And with me is Donna, who is going to talk about very, very impactful and pressing ideas, uh, suggestions on how best you can leverage the big movement right now around us, the AI era. So uh, the session is titled Revenge of the Nerds, how to build a niche testing career in the era of AI. And let's be honest, who hasn't wondered how to pivot their career towards AI to stay ahead of the curve, right? And our speaker, the dynamic personality, Donna Sarkar, who has multiple avatars, has not just made the shift herself, but has also guided countless others to do the same. As in one of her avatars as chief troublemaker at Microsoft AI and Copilot Accessibility Program, Donna is on a global mission to make AI genuinely useful for businesses across the globe. But that's not all. She's an author, an entrepreneur, and a recognized dynamic personality industry leader out there. So today, she's going to break down what AI truly means in today's world. There are lots and lots of interesting insights on how you can really stand out and leverage this moment out there. And there is a bonus for you all. She's going to reveal a unique job in the AI landscape that QA and test professionals are particularly well suited for. So Donna, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me and joining me today. I am in Istanbul, Turkey, actually, right now. And hilariously, Mohit is in Seattle, Washington, where I live. But I'm on holiday with my family. But I want to join you today because I want to share with you something really, really important, which is we are not consumers of technology. We are now in the creators of technology genre. OK, so let me share with you a set of slides. And please be patient while I figure out how to share slides. Because, you know, AV is always the biggest challenge to anything in the entire world. Um, so here is a thing that is really important. A lot of us have heard that, oh, look at me. I'm, I'm doing this horrible. Um, a lot of us have heard that AI is going to take our jobs, right? And Mohit, can you see this pretty good? So he, here's the thing. A lot, a lot of us have heard this thing. AI is going to take your job. Your job's not going to exist, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like to tell you that we're in this amazing moment where we nerds are about to get the best revenge ever, OK? We're going to get the best revenge. And I'd like first for us to take a moment and think about a time before generative AI took over our lives. And that moment was November 30th, 2022, OK? It was not this year, it was not last year, it was the year before. I was actually in Bangkok, Thailand on a customer visit when ChatGPT erupted on the scene. And all of us remember this because we thought, oh no, my mom's got a hold of it. Things are going to get weird, right? They're going to ask us strange questions now. We have to become experts in this. Since then, we've heard nothing but drama, right? Nothing but drama. AI is going to take my job, it's going to take my business, and then worse, a person with AI is going to take my job or business, right? How many of you have heard this? And it's extremely annoying. I'm raising my hand louder for the people in the back, okay? It's annoying because we're saying this, like there's a mythical group of people who use AI who's going to come to our job. That's not a thing. We all use AI and we have for a very, very, very long time. So let's do a little walk through history, okay? And talk about what is AI even? And of course, all of you are wicked smart tech people. I'm giving you language that you can use for the people in your life, okay? There's gonna be customers, bosses, partners, et cetera, who are like, what is AI? So I'm gonna give you a bit of language, ready? Okay, so this AI called predictive AI has been around for a long time. Actually, it's been around since 1950s with Alan Turing and the Turing test, okay? So Turing test was there to, create, to figure out whether an output was created by a machine or a human, could it decide? So AI and this concept of artificial intelligence and men and humans working together with machines to do a thing has been around for a long, 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 long time. But the big drama broke loose when 
we started relying on a big fancy autocomplete called generative AI to solve our problems and run our businesses. Okay. So generative AI is a subset of AI that provides the ability to create new things rather than predicting things based on an existing data set. Okay. What does that mean? So this means that we are looking at this concept called a GPT. Okay. All of us are like GPT. What is that? Okay. Let, let's re, let's visit generative meaning based on a model, right? AI model. You're generating new things. You're not just predicting based on what's there. Generate a new concept. So instead of, let's look at an older one. Um, remember those AI models where you're like hot dog or legs or chicken or golden doodle or muffin or chihuahua? You'd say like muffin chihuahua, muffin chihuahua, you tag them and then you'd upload a new picture of a muffin or a chihuahua and it would identify, oh, this is a muffin, this is a chihuahua. That is called predictive AI because you're predicting, is this this or is this that? In generative AI, you're going to create a new muffin or a new chihuahua or a hybrid, which would be weird, but true, right? Generative. Pre-trained, meaning it's trained offline. Everyone was like, oh, AI is stealing my data and updating in real time. No, it's very expensive. It doesn't work that way. And no. Okay. And the third one is transformer. And the transformer is all about the relationships between words. It's about the importance of a specific word. So I'm in Istanbul. And I'd say there are a lot of cats in the city. The important word here is cats. It's not we or there or city, because those are just generic words. But cats is the key word to we are in Istanbul. There's a lot of cats here, right? So transformer really identifies this is the most important word in this sentence. So pay attention to it. Okay. Okay. So generative pre-trained transformer has led to this thing called. ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot, Google Gemini, um, Meta, what is it called, Llama 3. There's a million of them, okay? There's a lot. But they all kind of work the same. And I'm sure you know this, but I'm going to give you a little visual breakdown so you remember for when you have to explain it to people. Ready? Okay. So large language models, which we all deal with, are broken. What they do is they break strings of words into things called tokens, okay? So imagine there's a sentence called, we go to work by train. Okay, that is the sentence. What the large language model will do is break it into a series of characters. Think of it like a syllable called a token. So in the sentence, we're going to have six tokens. We go to work by train. If there's a long word like anthropomorphization, that would be probably seven tokens by itself. But right now we chose short words for simplicity's sake. Okay, so the large language model takes a sentence, breaks it into tokens. Then after it tokenizes, it goes to work, looks in the data set that it's trained on and starts finding words that are near it. And in this case, the word that's interesting is work. It's like, all right, importance. Let's go with the word work. What are some words that are near it? Okay. So it turns out the words near the word work in the pre-trained data set, right, which it was the internet are things like rewarding, creative, teams, produce, collaborative, finish, outstanding, this, office, a bunch of words near the word work based on blog posts, Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a bunch of words that are not near the word work, dove, zebra, polka, atmosphere, okay? So set of words that are near the word work, set of words that are not near the word work. Then each of them gets what's called a weight. And how near is it to the word work in the data set, okay? Once it has that, it's able to create a thing called a vector. Now, words that are very similar in meaning, meaning context, meaning similar in the data set, are going to have similar looking vectors. Words that are different are going to have different looking vectors. LLM's large language model has no idea what a word means. It just knows, does it show up more often here or does it show up more often there? So the vectors for sea and ocean are going to look similar, and the vectors for football and soccer will look similar. But the vectors for C and football, not going to look similar, right? Because they're, they have different meanings, air quotes, but they show up differently in the data set. So that's pretty much what a large language model is doing. So when you see words like semantic, right, which you see a lot, it just means how similar is it in meaning, air quotes, how often it's seen in the data set near that specific word. So imagine if document one you see, and this is a US example, excuse me, is Obama speaks to the media in Illinois 
because of semantic, it's near these words in the data set, the president greets the press in Chicago, it's going to be similar, okay? Because those words are not exactly the same, meaning keyword search, it's doing a thing called semantic search. The way to remember it is to say similar to, semantic. So it's not the exact word, it's something similar to, yeah? Okay. Now, I'm sure because all of you are smart, everyone annoys you about this thing called retrieval augmented generation. Okay, rad, rad. Oh, what's your rag pattern? Which method you're using? Cosine similarity, this, all rag means is did you upload a file or give some more information to your large language model so it has current data? Because the thing with pre-trained is that it's old. Even if you look at the most late, latest version of ChatGPT or whatever, it's probably trained in, what month is it? It's August. Probably finished being trained in March. So you're not going to be able to see like, oh, who won the Olympics? So it's probably not up to date. So it's going to do a thing called retrieval augmented generation, which imports new data. Right now for ChatGPT, Bing search does that weirdly. But if you're using a language model that's out of the box, you're going to have to implement your own retrieval augmented generation, give it more up-to-date, more accurate example. Okay, so that's what is AI even, okay? I hope you have a good idea. You knew that. I'm giving you information so you can explain to others. Second part is, is this AI thing, is it business, is this real or is it nonsense, right? Cool, it's, it's a cool technology, but do we care? And the answer is really simple. And the answer is yes. It's nonsense, but it's also real. Okay, let's visit some nonsense because you all will appreciate it. There's a company I'm not allowed to make fun of anymore in front of people whose AI product will legitimately tell you to go put glue in your pizza or rocks, eat one rock a day, jump off the cliff. Don't do that, but it's giving you that information because the retrieval augmented generation for the language model was Reddit. Do you believe everything you see on Reddit? The answer is no. Please do not believe everything you said on Reddit. But because this language model used Reddit as its retrieval augmented generation, it's saying, it's saying weird things to you. So please check your sources on AI. Second, my family's not bought into AI at all, right? We have this ongoing family discussion where we, we love to plan trips, we love to travel. And I'll often tell my sister like, oh, Microsoft Copilot said this. And she said, I don't care about your boring thing. I don't care what chat GBT does not care. Because most normal people haven't heard nothing but hype and don't have a very useful use case or scenario that makes sense to them. So why does that happen? And part of this is because we tech people say the strangest things to people. Okay, we have been for a long time, but there's some people who say very strange things. So for example, Elon Musk said in 20, 2015, okay, that was almost a decade ago, self-driving cars will happen in two years. We're not going to drive anymore since 2017. I don't know where you live, but in Istanbul, 100% of people driving cars in cars are driving. Like there's no cars driving themselves in Istanbul. That's not even true in Seattle, Washington, honestly. Radiologists are supposed to be obsolete, so like people who do x-rays. They're not, we need them. There's no radiology that does itself. And now here we are in 2024, radiologists are stuck in cars driving to work. Because we make this huge proclamation acting like tech is gonna take over the world, people stop believing us, okay? And that's the AI hype. But unlike most hype cycles, AI actually has some good, good scenarios, okay? I found this very interesting. So my this colleague of mine, Ashley Vance, not technical, not dev, she said, we can talk about how limited these models are and how they don't do anything, but she took one of her parents' x-rays, chest x-rays, in Spanish into ChatGPT, and she was able to get a complete diagnosis before the doctors were. And she was able to guide the conversation with her doctor, with her parents' doctor, just based on stuff she got from ChatGPT. Why? Because it's got a bunch of images similar in the training data, right? So it's just a science project at this point. And people are acting like, oh, this is magic, or no, it's good for nothing. On the scale of magic and good for nothing, AI is right in the middle. But we have to embrace that and really identify the scenarios that make sense, right? Okay, so here is some even better news. There's a lot of companies being, being created around AI. Startups are startuping. So if you look, there are a lot of startups all around the world. And this 
this data snapped in 2023, okay? So US, of course, has 5,000 startups, China has 1,400, India has 338, I think it's more. There's a lot of newly funded AI startups. That's interesting because AI is expensive. So that means that all these startups are doing something to solve a problem and people are willing to fund it because they believe in the problem. That's interesting because it's not just like Donna's nonsense startup to like choose colors for, I don't know, water. It's a real startup that people are like, yeah, I can see that's a problem. I'm going to fund you, right? I like that. That's good. But it's not just startup people. It's also job people. So imagine you have a job and you have a job as a content writer, a graphic designer, marketing manager, whatever it is. You're tired of hearing AI is going to take your job. You say, no, no, no. Instead, I'm going to define how AI is used in my job. So there's this group of people who are saying, I'm going to learn AI and use it to do my job better, okay? And ironically, the top three are content writers, graphic designers, marketing manager. We're like, oh, that's interesting. So they're doing something kind of cool. They're becoming a thing called the power user of AI. They're saying, I am going to decide how AI is used for my industry. I love this, right? Because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know how AI is going to disrupt testing. I'm going to wait till someone tells me. Why? Why are you waiting? No, you decide because you're the expert. I own a fashion company. I own a bar. I'm trying to you know, become a perfumer randomly. Um, I'm not going to wait for somebody, some expert air quotes, to tell me how AI is going to be used. They don't know. They don't know my industry. I'm going to decide for them. I'm going to decide for me and my industry. And you can see that this is true on the very right, there's these green bubbles. And that show what power users are doing. They're saying, I research and learn new prompts. I regularly experiment with different ways to use AI. Before starting, can I figure out, can AI help me with this? They're power users. And they're saying, I'm going to decide how AI is used. And they're leading. You can see how they are. They're leading all the way over here. Everyone else, the laggards are all the way over there. And these are the people who are going to get jobs in the AI verse because they're the ones who are going to decide how it's used. So all of you who work in testing, test automation, QA validation, start figuring it out for not just the industry, but for your area. The kind of work you do the best, where can AI help? Where can AI not help? But you need to write this down and you need to become the expert because no one knows it better than you. No one. I don't. Mohit doesn't. No one knows it as well as you. Okay. So I want to show you this weird stat. I didn't pull the numbers recently, but... Um, Global AI jobs have increased 43%. 43%. That is a very large number. It went from 33,000 to 47. Like, that's a lot. This number is even higher now. So across the world, right? If you search for um, LinkedIn jobs with AI in the title keyword description, you're going to see this. The number of jobs that are going up month over month, quarter after quarter, it's not going to get less. It's not going to go away. I guarantee it. It's just going to go up, 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 up. Because companies are trying to hire people like you. We're inquisitive and creative to help them decide how AI is going to transform their industry. Okay, so next one. This Boston Consulting Group study, and I recommend you all look this up, okay? Go look, go look. It shows two sets of people, Boston Consulting Group, doing guess what, consulting. One set used AI, the other set didn't. Mm, six months, guess what happened? The people using it got promoted, got better gigs, got better opportunities, were seen as wiser. And the other set weren't. Of course, this is a lawsuit, right? Because an employee can tell their employer, like, hey, you're holding me back by not giving me access to these tools. But honestly, I don't believe in waiting for your employer. I believe in going out and learning all this on your own. So when it becomes mainstream, you already are an expert. You're not on ground zero, day one, amateur. You're already an expert. You're like, yeah, I've been doing this forever. Best practices. Here's a guidebook. Here's prompts. Here's stuff to do. Scenarios. Do it. You're a leader. Okay? Be a leader. Don't be this left around, left behind BCG group. No. Okay. So a lot of you are wondering, what are you? I talk forever. Okay. A lot of you are wondering, what does that have to do with me? Why are you talking about this? I don't care. Don't. Look. I thought that. Okay. I thought that. I had a fairly normal job at Microsoft uh, about two years ago. Okay, I used to run the accessibility tech program where I'd wrangle all of our products to make sure they're accessible to people with disability, neurodivergence, mental health. Normal job. 
And then Microsoft started dropping cult pilots, okay, which are our version of AI products. Bing Chat Copilot, Word Copilot, PowerPoint Copilot, Windows Copilot, 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 Copilot. Here's AI, AI, AI. People are trying to just do their job, and Microsoft's drawing, dropping AI. And I'm sitting there like, how do people track this? We have thousands of products, and now all of them have some random Copilot or AI product. How do we keep track? How do we even figure out what they do? So I started writing it down. I keep a big spreadsheet, product. Copilot, what does it do? I have 100 plus of these at this point, okay? 100 plus. So I said, you know what? I'm going to write this down. And I would love for everyone to screenshot this page. If you work with Microsoft or work with AI at all, this might be an interesting resource for you. I only say that because I keep it up to date every week with everything in my head, okay? It's called learn.microsoft.com slash copilot. And it is the place where we document everything that's going on with Microsoft Copilot and the AI verse in like some sort of a organized way. So Copilot Learning Hub, really four parts to it. One is understand Copilot and AI. Like what is it? What does it do? It's kind of like what I just explained to you. Second part is adopt. How do you deploy it? Third part is how do you extend it with data, your own data, data sources, databases, etc. And fourth one is how do you actually do it? Um, how do you actually build your own? And I've got the show called uh, Copilot Learning Hub. So if you use Microsoft Copilot and you have a cold scenario, let me know because I'd love to have you on the show and show off your scenario to everyone. So that is my project that I work on. I didn't think this was important until I started doing it. And then I learned something really important. AI is mostly testing, okay? Controversial statement, everyone wants to argue with me, but I have now tested every AI product at Microsoft for the last year and a half. And let me tell you how much testing I've done. I've done more testing for AI than I have for operating systems, holograms, Xbox gaming, anything, okay, by a lot, because it's involved in every step. It's not just involved at the end or like, you know, the API design, no. So here are five areas that I've spent a lot of time testing AI, okay? First, gathering the data that you're going to use to build the model. Because you want to build a model that is not terrible and inaccurate and just bad, right? So you're not like, okay, is this data good that I'm going to train the model on? I don't know. you got to test it. Make sure. Second part, you got to train the model. You have to say, like, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat. Guess what? Testing, right? And upload a new one. Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Testing, testing, testing. Then you do this thing called reinforcement learning human feedback. So this is, you say, okay, model, this is a good answer. This is not a good answer. So for generative AI, it's tricky and you need a person. You'll say, make me a list of five places going to Istanbul. You only know this if you're a Turkey expert. A person on the street is not going to know if this is a Turkey expert or not, right? So you need people who are experts in the space to be able to train your AI model on this thing testing. And then there's product development, which is like a lot of validating the spec, making sure you did the thing. It's just standard testing. And then the last part, you test the results. Does this model do what it said? Is it fair? Is it all of these things? And I'm going to talk to you more about this because that last phase, tricky, tricky, because it's not straight and narrow. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. So what, what, what does this all mean? What it means is our work is just getting started, okay? We think testing AI products out of the box are hard. We haven't seen anything, okay? Let me tell you a story of what's coming next. I need you guys, you all, to not freak out, okay? Cross your fingers, okay? Don't freak out what's coming next. So right now, Copilot and AI products are like this. They don't remember you, okay? If you go to ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot, Gemini, I don't care, you go ask, same question every day for 10 days, you're going to get a different answer and it has no idea of your context or memory. It's like, who, who, who's Mohit, who's Tana, who's Kavya? I've never met you in my life. You're like, what are good things to see in Istanbul? You'll probably get the same answer. We will get different answers, but it doesn't remember that you're you and you've already answered this question, right? So it's like being on 50 first dates. Every single time, it's like a new conversation. You're like, oh, I have to set context again. 
I'm Donna. I'm from Seattle. I'm visiting Istanbul with my family. I've already rented these. Can we give me more instructions going to this? Right? So you have to give it a lot of context. So what does this mean? This means that we have already been through this era of predictive AI, which I just gave you a big spiel about, right? Dog, cat, blueberry, muffin. We're in the era of generative AI, which is what we're at now. And then next up, it's a new thing called agentic AI. And if you think life is real complicated now, because we live in this non-deterministic world, generative AI generates new things. Imagine them getting agentic. What is agentic? I'm so glad you asked this question. You didn't ask it all. But I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this. And this is where being a tester is gonna be really fun and very hard, right? So an agentic workflow, okay? You, the user, are gonna set a goal. You're gonna say something like, build me a website for a bar in Seattle, Washington called Side Hustle. Just saying, you know, for no reason. Okay. Time. I take the prompt from the user, set that as a goal. Now AI is going to create a plan. Okay, build website, pull information from existing website, find wine bar info, find location, hours, whatever. Then it's going to execute the task, execute, build a website, pull this information, make a PDF, do this, do that, publish HTML. Then it's going to process the results and then reprioritize. Okay. This is an agentic workflow. You can see this is different than a AI workflow, because AI workflow would be take the prompt and do the thing. That's it. It would be step one, step three, nothing else. And every time you'd have to prompt again, have a lot of information, etc. Here, because of the agentic workflow, you're going to have something different. So I'm just talking about the agentification of Copilot, but this applies to all AI. Okay. So how's that going to work? You're going to have a bunch of stuff. First, context. I am an agent that helps Donna with her bar that she owns in Seattle, Washington. Context, memory. Last week, I helped her assemble a wine list of local wines in Washington State. Then I'm going to help her plan. Okay, she needs to build a website. So first, I need to pull some information. I need some pictures. We need some copy. Plan, 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 right? Fourth one, extensibility. Do I need to pull data from the internet? Do I need to pull from some random other website? Do I need some... Is there an API I need to call? Plugins and connectors, right? And then the fifth one, automation. If that winery that I pulled data from updated its description, do I have to pull it into my website? Probably, right? So it's accurate. This is now the agentification of AI or Copilot. This is next, okay? Starting from Microsoft, starting November, this is all you're going to hear about actually starting in September, this is all you're going to hear about. And you're going to hear from all the other companies as well. So start using these words, agentic, agentification, because it's just AI plus automation, but planning, okay? Just get used to this idea because this is going to be the future. This is where AI actually becomes useful because it's going to help you do five things now and probably more in the future, okay? So first one, is you and the agent work together to solve a problem. Okay, interesting. Reflection. Agent does the work and then it thinks about how to do things better. Third, tool use, functions, API, you know, connectors, plugins, et cetera. So you know how to do that. Fourth one, agent comes with the plan and executes. And the fifth one, multiple agents work together. Oof. So I'm gonna show you some examples. You can practice now. You don't have to wait. Agent prompt day is something like this. This is a whole sorry, I almost threw this water on the ground. Um, agent prompt day is like you can paste this entire prompt somewhere. You may screenshot it if you're interested. You'll be my negotiating negotiation teacher. It will simulate a scenario where I engage. After getting my response, you'll tell me how I can do better. Here's the scenario. Put the whole prompt in. And then suddenly, you know, like Microsoft Copilot or ChatGPT or whatever will do this for you. So I just pasted the prompt. I'm not going to make you suffer through this horrible thing. But you're now going to get an answer. Like, okay, first scenario is getting Java for a Somali as a wine bar in Seattle. And Copilot will do this for you. It'll be like, okay, here's the initial offer. Counteract. Come back to me. So it, this is agentic prompting. You can just do this now. You don't have to wait. Second one is like reflection. So write a social media post to do something. Pause. Think of three ways to make it better. That's cool, right? Because you didn't have to do this work. It's kind of agenty prompting. I mean, I'm not going to make you do it, but you can imagine how it's going to look. So tool use. 
Tool use is all about how to use external sources. And I want you all to try this if you haven't. Either use Azure OpenAI Service or OpenAI or Gemini, whatever you want. But go figure out how you can plug into external sources. So for me, I'm not, again, going to make you watch this, but over here, you're going to see, OK, I made an assistant called Do The Thing, helpful assistant to Donna, who answers questions. Here's the model. Here's the stuff. I've uploaded four manuscripts that I've written called Do The Thing, Imposter Syndrome, Line 47, Spin Your Tail. These are four books that I've written. I've uploaded them here. So it answers questions in my tone. OK, so is it going to do it? Let's see. So what would Donna say to someone who wants to learn AI? And then it's a bit theatrical, right? But it gives you steps that I would probably give you. And here's an email template that I have in one of my books. And then it has emojis that I would use. So this agent that represents me, that I put guardrails around, is able to go and answer questions on behalf of me to people. But they also know that this is an agent answering, right? How does this work? You can actually look this up in ChatGPT. There's a thing called memory. So if you go into personalization, you'll see a thing called memory, flip it on or off. And then it has a bunch of information about you based on questions. It wants to engage in de detailed negotiation for a workshop, blah, blah, blah. You can create it. You can, uh, sorry, clear it. You can clear certain, just like your recommendations on Netflix or Amazon, whatever it is. So one of the most interesting agents that I see right now is called GitHub Copilot Workspace. And Mohit, I know you're an expert at this, but a lot of people don't know about it. But go get in line for it because it's actually going to do stuff for you, right? So I've decided I'm going to make a website for my wine bar in Seattle, Washington. But I don't want to make a website because I'm not a web dev and I'm bad at it. So instead, I'm going to go to my Copilot Workspace and make a plan. Okay, so I'm going to choose my repo, side hustle. Everyone knows a repo for their wine bar, right? Um, so I'm going to say this, watch. Create a website for a wine bar in Seattle called Side Hustle. Create a wine list of low intervention wines from Washington State. Low intervention means doesn't have sugar and additives. Okay, cool. Um, it's just doing this. I'm not doing anything at this point. I'm not ironically drinking a glass of water while it makes this fun. Okay, so it's making a plan. It's proposing a plan. Okay, I'm going to stash this website in your repo. Cool, great. Index.html, basic, readme. And I'll say, OK, sounds good. Here's a proposal. Please generate a plan. I'm going to click on the plan. OK. Now it's going to make a plan for me. Let's see what it does. So add a section to the wine bar, create a wine list on the HTML. Do I want to implement these files? This is the plan. Okay. This is doing all of it. And here you can, you can regenerate the plan if you don't like it. You can modify the plan. You can leave comments. You can change it. You can do all sorts of things. I'm going to say, yeah, just roll. Let's see what happens. So this thing is now going to generate me an index.html. It's going to be terrible, right? Because I didn't give it colors. I didn't give it any pictures. I didn't do anything. But look, it's generated some really basic HTML with some wine, low intervention from Washington State. These are accurate. Now I can even do a pull request. What happens? It's hideous, but it's it's there. I didn't do this. I didn't build this HTML page. I don't know how to. I'm I'm terrible at it. I'm C plus plus stuff. So this doesn't solve. This doesn't replace you. It helps you. It augments you. It's an assistant, not a replacement, right? And it's important for all of you to realize agents are going to be a part of your life and a part of your job. But where is it going to augment you and help you? Where is it going to be a superpower? Where can you not be afraid of it? There will be lots of testing agents, automation agents, et cetera. But they're there to help you, the expert. So let me show you an example of a thing called Autogen Studio. Okay, This is from Microsoft. It's open source. You can go try it today. It's called Autogen Studio. My family and I, of course, love travel. My sister loves planning itineraries. But I am bad at it. So I said, let me give her something to do. So I gave Autogen Studio this goal, plan a trip to Istanbul. Okay, I didn't give it very much context. So Autogen Studio, plan a trip to Istanbul. Let's see what happens. It's going to be like, OK, plan a trip. Planner assistant kicks in. Plan a trip. I need to gather some information. Here's some information. And it gathers. OK, where is it coming from? Where are you going? Which wall is there? And then it's going to okay, ask a bunch of stuff. And then 
I'm just forwarding through this so I can show you so it doesn't take so long. And then it takes like forever. Okay, ready? Okay, got some more information for me. Planner assistant. Okay, given this, it's creating a plan. So planner assistant kicks in. Local assistant is going to make a plan based on recommendations, historical sites, the Hagia Sophia, the Sultimate, Basilica Cistern. We ironically did all this, by the way. We just finished it. See cultural stuff, see fashion stuff, fashion center, um, and then nature and history. And then guess what? Local, I didn't do any of this, by the way. This is just the agents in AgentCon or in uh, Autogen. Language assistant gives me a bunch of stuff to do so I can learn basic words in Turkish and not be rude. Merhaba is hello, as far as I got. Okay, so let's, let's review this. User proxy means deals with the user and behaves as the user, okay? It calls the planner assistant. Planner assistant's like, I shall prepare a trip to Istanbul, great. Calls the local assistant and do like this tourist thing, this tourist thing, this tourist thing. And then it calls the language assistant for cultural. And it's four agents working together, multi-agent scenario. This is gonna be our life. And you know what's a killer? Testing, this is hard. Each one of these, you can think of as a co-pilot or, or AI. Now you have four of them working together, calling each other. Is that gonna be weird? What if this user proxy doesn't give you an answer? Do none of these get called? I don't know. We don't know. What if one of them gives you a bad answer? What if one of them gets hot? I don't know. We have so much work to do. So that's when people are like, oh, AI is gonna take your job. I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this. We're gonna be busier than we've ever been in our lives. You're like, whatever, Don, I don't care. What can we do about it? So first of all, we're going to believe nothing. Okay, nothing. Every week, I take a screenshot of a CEO who's gone fooled by deep fakes. This week, it was Ferrari executives, this guy. So they got almost got fooled by the CEO acting as, um, or the deep fake people acting as the CEO. They were smart enough to do personal questions, but... Two weeks ago, it was WPP, then it was like some finance company. This happens every week and it's going to keep happening. We're going to believe in nothing. So the value and price of personal brands and human to human contact is going to go up, 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 Okay. So if you don't have a very human brand or human reputation, please start building it in your own voice, in your own tone, everything. Because that is when people are going to want to do business with you. They're not going to want to do business with this nameless, faceless AI thing. They're going to want to do business with you. You can already see we've got some issues like this guy in Japan, he married a hologram and he can't even communicate with her because he didn't pay his bill. This guy, he got an AI therapist who told him real strange things. And then this guy, AI girlfriends, turns out they steal your data, like your first home, your first pet, your first teacher. That's how you get hacked. So things are getting strange. So this value and price of personal communication will become more. And then human created, curated, and delivered information will become a luxury item. Like Eric, Eric McGeon of um, Zoom CEO is like, yeah, we're going to have digital twins who sit in our meetings. That technology already exists. Okay. I've seen it. I've seen it across the board. It's in everything. It's in Teams and Zoom and Meet and this and that. Because we've already had avatars. Now we can have avatars who do stuff for us with guardrails. And then... Meta just introduced Digital Twin where it can answer questions on your behalf with Carter. So imagine you're going to run into someone's AI versus running into them as a person. You're going to really value the person much more than you did before. So as Mohit and Kavya promised, we're going to start jobs. Okay. Everyone has a role to play in the AI verse if they want one. And I'd love for you to put yourself into the category and figure out who. These beautiful people were my accessibility team. No one is a dev in this picture, right? So the first one are machine learning people. I'm not sure how many of you are machine learning people. I'm not. I learned it. College. I don't love it. It's boring. But if you want to learn it, your job will be to train model, fine tune model, document model, figure out like what is your model good for, bad for. If you want to learn, go to deeplearning.ai and start doing the intro, this machine learning specialization. It's fine. You can do it. Anyone on, you can do it. It's a great way to get a good feel for the industry and what people are talking about. Next one is called, but you know, as experts in the problem space. 
this is my friend Patricio who's in a uh, wheelchair, paralyzed, and he's able to tell me for a paralyzed person, I need to be able to use a head mouse. I'm like, what is a head mouse? I didn't know about this. So they define the problem, define the solution, and say these are good solutions, these are great solutions. So this is your standard, like product manager, business expert, et cetera. This is a job because you're going to be able to say, this is a job for AI or this is not a job for AI. Very important. Third one is the data person. Data person, and I'm sure some of you are data people. The good news is you're going to be employed forever. The bad news is you're never going to be able to retire. No one's going to let you do it. Okay. So data expert, you're going to identify data sources. You're going to identify issues like this. There's gaps. There's issues insecure data, et cetera, et cetera, out of date. And then you're going to take the data to be AI-able because until the data is in a place that makes any sense inside of some sort of a source that you can read from, extensibility, et cetera, it doesn't make any sense. So keep doing your data thing, sort it, organize it, say it's good, say it's bad, et cetera, rank it, do all the stuff. Fourth one, this is your standard product developer, okay? Solution builder, let's call it your dev, your local dev, your whatever it is, some sort of a maker. Your job is to co-design the solution, research and prototype, use your feedback, usual job. But before you go fine tuning a model, figure out all the tools that exist. First, figure out, do you need AI in this anyway? Second, if you do, can you use something that exists? And third, is it good, is it bad, right? So our, I, I'm in this category of being a dev. I have to always figure out, do I need AI for this or am I just being a product, right? Okay, fifth one, you're gonna like this. There's a new job in tech news. Okay, new job called the validator. There's lots of job names. IT admin, tester, insider, red teamer, responsible AI expert, lots of words. These beautiful people are my former accessibility team. Nobody comes from tech. They're all experts in accessibility, but not in AI. And every single one of them now spend their time looking at solutions and saying, does it have strange bias against people with disability? Does it deploy to the right people who need it? Like you don't need screen reader tech for people who are sighted. And then they teach people to use it. How do you teach somebody who is paralyzed to use AI with a head mouse? I don't know. Only people who are good at teaching can use it. So this concept of a job, you think of it as a tester, but so much of it is looking at and saying, is this AI model biased toward people who live in this part of the world or speak this language or are this gender, whatever it is. Looking at responsible AI as a principle, but also as a lifestyle, right? So this one is going to be very important and every company is hiring like this. Microsoft recently hired, I think, 50 people to do this kind of job because you need them for every product. So you're going to see this across the board. Validator, red teamer, okay? Keep in mind. And then, bonus job called AI security. This is where I'm learning. It's hard, but you have to think about it. You have to say like, okay, there's secure code, secure data, secure access. My friend Rob, Rod Trent is, I think, one of the foremost experts in the world. You should follow him if you care about this, but AI security is going to be a whole thing. I don't know enough about it, but I want to. Okay. So, of course, there's homework. Of course, there's homework, right? It's me. You're not going to leave without homework. I want you to remember that we're only in year two. Okay. You all are young, so you don't remember there's a thing called car phones. You like pick up this walkie-talkie looking thing in your car and call, and it costs a lot of money to make a phone call. You should not use it unless you've been murdered, in which case maybe don't use it anyway. Second, there's a thing called a Nokia flip phone. And you'd like dial your friend number. Um you could only call your friend after like eight o'clock at night and you could text them using number. So you'd be like eight, eight, seven, seven, six, six, six. So say, where are you? And then you could play a game called snake. All of you who are my age and around are laughing. All of you who are young are thinking, lady, you were weird. That was not a thing. And I don't know how to tell you this, but it was an era. And we all had Nokia flip phones and we all had covers for them. And we had ringtones. No, we had ringtones. A bunch of you had like 50 cent in the club. Like you did, don't lie, you did. And then there's the iPhone era, right? Where we took a phone and then we had a huge debt platform. iPhone, when it came out, it didn't used to be a cash register, a boarding pass, a Kindle reading device, the thing you watch TV on. No, you never could have imagined these. But because of developers and testers and makers, it became those things. We're not there. 
the day on. You're not late. You're early. We're in year two. This is Nokia flip phone era. AI can do like three things kind of good, but it will do thousands of things kind of do good, but not without people like you. Because iPhone didn't do anything good till developers and testers and product managers got involved, right? We are the people who built the apps that ran on an iPhone. We're also going to be the people who build apps that run on AI. Okay, so wrap your heads around that. All of us, every single one of us, are going to be AI operators or validators or both. So what I recommend all of you do is really embrace this. Okay, embrace this. This feels weird because we're all in the innovator category. All of us are like, oh, I'm an early adopter. No, you're not. You're a stage before that called innovator. You're creating the thing that early adopters will adopt. There's nothing to adopt. Say you're a tester of websites to, uh, devoted to expense tools. To no one who has mastered the AI of that. But why should that not be you? You already know all of the issues. You know what's good, what's bad, currency, this thing, that thing. You know it. You know where AI can be useful, where AI can not be useful. You know maybe vision recognition is good or it's bad or whatever. It is. You know better than anyone. You're the innovator. Once you create, document, red team, whatever, guide, you pass off to early adopters who use it and try and give you feedback. But you, my friends, are in the innovator category. If you weren't, you wouldn't be sitting around on this random conference, right? This is an amazing, amazing event that the testing and you people are putting on. And I'm so grateful to them because they're focusing on the future. They're not focusing on what was the new hotness in 1995 or even last year. They're focusing on the future. The lineup is all future. So thank you because this conference is innovators. It's full of innovators and all of you attending are also innovators. So I have homework for you. First, if you use AI or Copilot, Copilot Learning Hub, right? Learn.microsoft.com slash Copilot. Create a prompt or scenario for Copilot if you use Microsoft products. Two, tell everyone. Share on social, tag me. I'm Donna Sarkar. I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn or Twitter. Third, I want you to come on my show. I've got a show. I'm right now in the screenshot showing with my friend Sandra. I want you to show off your scenario because only you are the expert in your field. And if you've got beautiful QA scenarios or testing scenarios or automation scenarios, those are the things that will first make you well known, two, establish your expertise, and three, help others validate whether this works for them or not. Okay, so I have talked way too long and we have time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing slides now, but you have homework and please do get in touch. Figure out your co-pilot, figure out a scenario, figure out a prompt and come share with me. Yes? Yes. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to go back to the screen. And this, this is phenomenal, uh, Donna, this is phenomenal. And uh, thank you so much for bringing the world into this uh, uh, conversation and really giving us uh, very real life examples from around our own life. It was, I can't just say it's a crash course on uh, generative AI. I think it just really brought the world around us right into this session. So thank you so much, uh, Donna, for taking our time and joining us uh, at midnight. Uh, I'll just uh, take one question from our attendees, which kind of summarizes a lot of interest which is coming from many of them. Uh, so what's what will the job landscape look like, especially in the testing space a uh, couple of years down the line? And if that's going to happen, where should I start? Where can I get the skills? What's the starting point? So the main thing is the landscape for testing people is going to look like pe companies are going to hire folks at every step of AI. Okay, so there's going to be, hey, test the data we're going to use to train our model or fine tune the model. So they may use a model out of the box or they may say, like, is this good data to even train on? And half the time, the answer is going to be no, this data is totally terrible. Where did you get it? It's out of date. It's not accurate. It's biased, blah, 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 right? Bad data means bad data. So it starts there. The second part will be saying, okay, we've trained a model. Is the model giving you good answers or bad answers? Reinforcement learning, human feedback. You're going to spend all day, because I do this. I'm only saying, telling you what I do. And my God, this is not going to go anywhere. If you're not going to use AI to do human enforcement, right? That doesn't make any sense. And you're not going to use automation for it either, by the way. You're going to have to do it yourself. You're going to say, 
this is really, really offensive toward people who live in India. This is really offensive toward people who work in software. This doesn't make any sense. It's not giving good answers. The good answer, bad answer, good answer, bad answer, okay? And the third one is you take the AI, you build it into a product. And the third step is, is this correct? Is it secure? Is it biased? Is it giving you, doing human accountability? Is it telling you it's an AI thing? Or is it off the rails and saying wrong things? Does it need to be taken down? What happens when it's in an infinite loop? What do you do? So think about everything you've done for automation, which you all have done. Now multiply it by 100, and that is AI for you. So every step of automation times every step of generative AI is where you're going to be working. But every company is going to hire for this. I've never seen people hire more testers in my life, honestly, as I have right now. So people with test background start thinking, right? Start using the word red team, okay? Red dash team. Start using that word because it means testing AI. It's a security term we stole it, but it means validating AI is actually doing what it's supposed to and not horribly biased and random towards specific groups of people. So start, do exactly what I said. Find an AI product, write prompts that work, write prompts that don't work, and write like red teaming documents. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm individually, personally feeling so much more inspired and thank you so much for giving that homework. I think I feel more anchored and so does uh, our attendees on what can be like a specific takeaway and getting started on this journey. Thank you so much, Donna. I wish we could have you on, uh, on this session and could hear many more of these beautiful stories that you're bringing to life for us. Thank you so much for joining and we'll definitely have you again on this forum uh, of course. soon. Thank you all so much. Have an amazing conference. You know, I'm very, very easy to find. Do your homework. Have a great conference. Bye. Bye, everyone.